This isn't the last lecture we're going to have on John. In fact, we'll probably have one more at least on because we have to talk about his baptism and about Jesus' baptism. So that's going to take another discussion completely because it's such a kind of a pivotal event in uh, the life of Jesus. But we've talked about, I, I want you to get used to thinking not just about the storyline as being a historical story, but I want you to think also about it containing literary motifs, which also um, are used by the writer to, uh, to interpret the story for you. And that's pretty much what I want to do with this today. I want to show you that John isn't just a historical figure in this story, but he becomes, in the hands of Luke, a literary motif as well. We have to figure that out, or we have to, uh, we have to see that in order to help, help us uh, follow what Luke is doing. We looked uh, Tuesday at the birth story. We saw that it was a very detailed, elaborate comparison between the birth of Jesus and the birth of John, or rather in reverse, the birth of John the birth of Jesus, at least in the birth story, John comes first. <coughs> we also saw that the way Luke put this story together, he was, he was demonstrating that even in their births, the elaborate, miraculous phenomena that accompanied these births were far greater in Jesus' birth at every point. Therefore, you, the reader, are supposed to make the conclusion, or the conclusion is supposed to be clear before you, that if you were to judge the importance of a historical figure by the, um, uh, by the, uh, the nature of his birth, her birth, then you would say that Jesus is greater than John. This was, a, this was a, a, an accepted way of introducing the story of, of great people in antiquity. It occurs not just in the Old Testament, but it occurs in other Jewish literature, Josephus, Philo. It also occurs in Greek literature. Um, so this was a pretty normal way of beginning a, a, a hero story with the story of their birth. <clears throat> the conclusion, though, that Jesus is greater is the difficult part for us because we don't really have to have that demonstrated. And so actually Luke is accomplishing something with his storytelling so far that actually didn't need to be demonstrated for us. And that presents a little bit of a problem because if we um, read a story that's 2,000 years old and we fail to get the point for one reason or another, either because um, of a cultural distance between us or maybe you know, any number of reasons might contribute to it, um, that's a problem. The goal here is to figure out what's in Luke's head as he writes this story. We have to let him talk to us. Sometimes to let him talk to us, we have to sort of like become like a fly on the wall in the first century. We have to leave ourselves behind, our questions behind, our presuppositions behind. And we have to travel back and just watch and observe. And let this storyteller tell his story. This is, uh, this is a difficult thing for us to do. Because um, you guys have been learning ever since, you know, kindergarten Sunday school class that the 
one of the most effective ways of reading the Bible is to, um, is to search for answers in it to your questions. And, and I don't, I'm not contesting the value of this. I think that, that uh, um, we do have our problems and our questions and our situations addressed to us in Scripture. But uh, it, might be, uh, it might be that to begin with our questions is the wrong place to begin. I think if you're, if you're going to read these as, um, as pieces of literature, you have to first aspire to get into the mind of the author, okay? And eventually, um, your questions will or might be addressed. You guys probably don't do this, but I know some people that, you know, they have a problem in their life, they just drop the Bible on the table and let it fall open, and then they just, you know, close their eyes, point to a scripture, and they expect God to speak to them that way. You know, and, and I'm not saying God is, is not able to do that. I just think that it, it's... Um, not the place to begin if you want to learn to read these as scripture. <clears throat> I think the place to begin is with the author. What did the author mean? To me, that's the most important question. What did the author mean? I call it authorial intent. It's just amazing how fun it is to figure out what the author was doing. And, and you may be surprised to find that in the process of figuring out his, his mind, his intent, you will have a lot of questions that, uh, from your own life that are, that are answered and dealt with. So don't think that this isn't a beneficial way to study Scripture. To me, this is actually a, 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 a way of studying Scripture that, that shows a lot of respect for the text. Anyway, this is a problem. Luke is going to great pains to to demonstrate with this literary structure that Jesus is greater than John. And uh, we were never of the opinion that he wasn't, right? So historical context, something has been lost in 2,000 years. The historical context where this was actually a powerful um, comparison has been lost to us. <clears throat> That's interesting. And I told you that the presupposition of this comparison is that John was more famous than Jesus. It's the, only, it's the only scenario where such a comparison actually accomplishes anything. And it's not that far, uh, it's not that far off either. And I think you'll see that after we look at the other places where John the Baptist is mentioned. We're going to find out. I'll give you guys a good sermon outline.
<coughs> that John was famous, he was feared, and he was followed. Three F's. Sometimes my um, ideas just work out that way. I don't intend it to. Not much of a preacher. Anyway, three F's. John was famous, feared, and followed. Let's look at the passages where he's mentioned. Okay? And let's just see what evidence we have of, of this kind of stuff. Who, who wants to start us out? I told you not to do chapters 1 and 2 because we did it Tuesday. So... What's what's next? Where does, huh? Three three two. Chapter three, verse two. You want to go through? Is that the the way it's the word of God came? The word of God came to him in the wilderness? I think so. <clears throat> okay. So then in chapter th- three, verse three, he goes and proclaims. And then, so in the rest, the, the rest of the verses in chapter 3, let's summarize. No, I was looking for something. Okay, so the word of God came to him. This is kind of interesting, these, these two verses right here, because this is a very um, recognizable event for Jewish people. This is the kind of the procedure that happens when a prophet is actually called and given a mission or a task. The word of God comes to them, they go and proclaim it to the people. So this is kind of a, we might call this um, a call story where John the Baptist receives a call, receives a message, a mission. He's a prophet. One of the things we're going to see, and I'm not going to do it today, but uh, one of the things we'll see about uh, this whole story beginning with John is how much activity there is of the Spirit of God. The people of Israel hadn't seen this kind of activity from the Spirit in a long time. <clears throat> so John is a very important person. He came, he's come to prepare. So there's somebody that um, 
he is preparing the way for, someone that he says is going to be greater than him, in fact, mightier, <coughs> stronger. He's, he's, someone who's coming after him is, is stronger than him. This is interesting because in, uh, in Luke chapter 11, one of the ways that Jesus describes him, Jesus tells a parable in chapter 11, and he, he describes himself a little bit with this parable because he's been accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul. So he tells them a story about a parable of the strong man and the stronger man. Remember? If you're going to, if you're going to rob, um, if you're going to rob somebody, you first have to tie them up before you can take all their stuff, right? Break into their house, tie them up. But in order to tie up the strong man, and here the devil or Beelzebul is called the strong man, you have to be stronger. This is him. He is the stronger one. It's in fact in Q, one of the uh, early Christian texts that Matthew and Luke both used, this story is actually told in Q. And in fact, I think that one of the, one of the titles that Jesus has in Q is the stronger one. The stronger one. Stronger than who? Well, stronger than anybody else. <laughs> stronger than the strong man. And the strong man is the one who has uh, taken possession of you. And for the stronger one to come in and rob from the strong man, he has to tie him up first. And that's what the exorcisms are representing. They're representing Jesus binding the strong man. So he can steal all his stuff. So in this parable, it's kind of funny. Jesus is a thief in this parable. You wouldn't normally think that Jesus would cast himself in the role of a thief, but here he does. He's a thief, and the stuff that he steals is you, uh, the stronger one. He's the stronger one. That goes all the way back to here. We find it all the way back in John's preaching. The mightier one, the stronger one. It's the first time we, we find it. So he's here to pr prepare. Um, then what happens in verses 18, 19, and 20? <coughs> you guys get your Bibles out. You're going to need to... Uh, Look it up. Look this stuff up. What happens in verses 18 through 20? Not a lot happens anyway. Come on, pitch in. Yeah. Uh, he starts picking up hairs and throwing them with him. Okay, here we've got the beginning of trouble with Herod. He criticizes him, and John gets thrown in prison. So, by verse 20 of chapter 3, um, John's in prison. It happens pretty fast. I mean, he just started preaching and he's in prison. Do you think it happened that fast? I mean, don't we have a significant period of time that takes place between verse 20, or verse 2 and verse 22? You know that this event, him being put in prison, doesn't have, doesn't, uh, well, it's talked about in Mark chapter 6. In fact, we're going to see in a minute um, that four chapters later, John is still in prison. So anyway, Luke tells us he gets thrown in prison. So he has a conflict with Herod. Herod, 
is one of the leaders, political leaders. I mean, he's one of the most powerful men in Palestine right now. And John, in good prophetic fashion, goes up to the leader and criticizes his behavior. That's something that prophets were never too successful at doing. I mean, they were always doing it, criticizing leaders, but they, uh, they always got in trouble for it. John is no exception. He gets in trouble for it. This trouble is going to be big trouble. <laughs> anyway, so he gets thrown, thrown in prison. Then what happens in verse 21 and 22? In 21 and 22, Jesus gets baptized. And that's kind of the end of this first series of things about John the Baptist. John, ha or I mean Luke, has John thrown in prison before he even tells you that Jesus is baptized. Why do you think he does that? Do you think he baptized Jesus from a prison cell? Or was this a historical faux pas here? Oops. I've seen people say this. Is this a big oops? He shouldn't have put John in prison before he even told about the stronger one getting baptized. Luke has uh, a reason, I think, probably, for doing it. I don't think that this is a mistake. Luke is a pretty good writer. I think it's pretty fair to say that before we accuse him of making a, making a mistake, we should give him the benefit of the doubt. One of the things that he can accomplish by getting Jesus or getting John put in prison is <coughs> He sort of gets John out of the way before the ministry of Jesus begins. And it's a way for him to compartmentalize these two people. Okay, so anyway, Jesus gets baptized in verses 21 and 22. What's the next passage where John occurs? Come on, you know, at the end of the semester, you guys are going to say that I didn't do enough discussion, that I lectured too much, and here I am asking you to participate, and you're not, so come on. Where is in the next passage that John pops up and appears? Chapter 5? 533? Okay, good. What, what happens here? Okay. They, they, um, they don't really know what Jesus is up to. It says the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. So, here we have a, a place where John the Baptist and Jesus are being compared. These guys, like the Pharisees and their disciples, they fast and pray.
These guys eat and drink. Okay. There's some differences between Jesus and John. <clears throat> What's the next one? Seven eighteen, okay. This one goes all the way to verse thirty-five, but there's actually two major pericopes in chapter seven. The first one is from eighteen through twenty-three. And then the second one is 24 to 35. So what happens in this little episode here from 718 to 23? John what? Yeah, he's in prison. John's still in prison. And he questions who Jesus is. He sends some of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the coming one? Or not. So John has he has doubts about Jesus. So he sends some of his disciples to ask him, are you the coming one or should I wait for someone else? Why do you think he asked that question? Now if anybody, if anybody should know who Jesus was, you'd think it would be John. But there's some doubt here. He has doubts. They what? Yeah, he's in prison. So he sends uh, some of his disciples from prison to ask Jesus. Can I ask a question about his doubts? Uh-huh, sure. Going back to when um, the angel came to Zacharias and to Zacharias' father, Sarah, Oh. So maybe maybe um, the fact that John's father doubted in the birth story. I never thought about that. Now we have John doubting. Never thought about that. No, 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 that's, that's, you're, you're, um, you're on good ground there. She said that maybe um, John was wondering about some of the things that Jesus has been doing because he didn't expect him to, didn't, because he didn't expect him to do those things? Yeah. Well, you know, when Jesus, or, or when John was preaching about the coming one, he was saying that the one who comes after him, you know, is going to carry the axe. Right? The axe is already laid at the root of the tree, is what John says. The one who's coming after him is going to judge. And here Jesus comes, and he's like this angel of mercy, showing compassion, healing. I don't think John really expected that. So I, I, like, your, I like your answer to that. When, when he, um, look at what Jesus says to them. 
He said, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. He has just given you a... Um, He has just given you sort of an expanded translation of Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. And then, so, Isaiah 61, 1. So John's disciples are supposed to go back and tell him this. And I like the last verse. Jesus says, And blessed is he who does not stumble over me. (laughs) Jesus was so gracious. But actually what he's saying to John is, John, this is what is happening. What is happening is a fulfillment of one of the servant songs from Isaiah. And blessed is he who does not stumble me. In other words, John, get in line. Stand down and get in line. He's warning him not to stumble over what he's doing. He's basically saying, you were right, I am the coming one, stand down. But it's still true that he was doing things that John didn't expect. Not very many people expected Jesus to look like that. The disciples were having a terrible time recognizing who he was. He was doing a lot of things that nobody expected the Messiah to come and do. Now, if this seems a little harsh, Then, in these next (coughs) 10 verses, Jesus begins to praise John. So, lest you misunderstand that somehow John is being... um, uh, criticized severely, These next verses should make up for that. And the disciples of John reported to him all these things. Oh, wait a minute. When the messengers of John had left, then Jesus began to speak to the multitudes about John. And he said to them, What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Then he says, look at verse 28. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. That's quite a that's quite a compliment. Among those born of women, there is none greater than John. I found a passage almost like this in Philo, who was a Jewish historian contemporaneous with the New Testament writers lived in Alexandria, he said almost exactly the same thing about Moses. 
There's no one greater than Moses. Jesus comes and says, there's no one greater than John. We come along 2,000 years later and we say, there's no one greater than Jesus. Right? Yeah, we do. We do. We say that. But I just want you to see that when, that when Jesus talks about John, he's got him up here. And he says, among those born of women, there is none greater than him. This guy is an important person. By the way, did you notice when he's explaining John to the people who are listening to him, he's talking to them as though they have already heard John. Who did you go out into the wilderness to see? Do you know what? They've all heard John. John has been around a while. They all know John. In fact, John is so well known that he's known by the political leaders. He's famous. You know that Jesus wouldn't ever meet Herod until the day before he dies. We're going to see that in a minute. John has already been there. He's already been on the, the front step of Herod's palace, condemning his life style. He's famous, and he's feared. Do you know why he is feared? Everybody is afraid of John. Herod was afraid of John. Because all the people thought him to be a prophet. So when when you mess around with John, I don't care who you are, when you mess around with John, you're messing around with sacred public opinion. Do you want to risk um, an uprising among the people by taking some sort of action against this prophet? He was feared. Political leaders were afraid of him. I just want you guys to, I want you to let the image that you have of John grow to the size that these passages almost require. What's the next passage? Nine what? Nine seven. What's this one say? Okay, is this the 7 through 9? Are there three, three verses here? Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, 7 through 9. This is where Herod hears about Jesus, right? He hears about Jesus, and he thinks that J.B. has been raised from the dead. Don't you think that's an odd thing for Herod to think about Jesus. Of course it is. Unless everybody knew John and nobody knew Jesus. Who's Jesus? He was afraid that it might be John raised from the dead. That's who he was afraid of. What's the next one? Nine what? 18? 19. What's this one about? <laughs> Great. So Herod hears about Jesus, thinks it's John the Baptist raised. The disciples are asked, who do the people say that I am? <coughs> and the people say, John the Baptist raised. The people are thinking it's John the Baptist raised from the dead. You guys seeing what I am? How 
John was this huge figure. And at this point, Jesus was a rather small one. What's the next passage? Pardon? 11 9? 11 1. Okay. What happens there, Mark? Oh, this is cool. The disciples come to Jesus and say, To Jesus, teach us to pray. <laughs> like John taught his disciples to pray. Jesus, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. You have a question? Do you ever see, was it ever mentioned that Jesus did in fact what John the Baptist were, or was it just mentioned that he acted like that? No, sometimes it's mentioned who they were. In fact, in the Gospel of John, the first four disciples that Jesus gets are from John's group. Um, that's a good question. Yeah. In fact, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to go back and talk about that in a minute. In Acts chapter 18, um, the apostles are preaching the gospel and they come across some of John's disciples who hadn't yet heard about the descent of the Spirit. So even in, even in the later parts of the book of Acts, we meet some of John's disciples. It's a good question. So, Okay, so this is kind of cool. Teach us to pray like John the Baptist. So even the disciples are using John as a model for Jesus. Don't you think that's kind of odd? I mean, we don't normally do this. We don't normally put G because we have we have a, a we have a perspective and a view of Jesus that just doesn't need this sort of elevation. Okay, what's the next one? <coughs> I think the next one is chapter 16. Verse 16. In Luke 16, 16, Jesus says, The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. So this is Jesus talking. The law and prophets until John. Since John, the kingdom of God. Since John, the kingdom of God is proclaimed. Do you know what's interesting about this? This saying of Jesus? Jesus hinges history on who? On John. We hinge history on Jesus. It's just a small point, but it's one I wanted you to see. We have B.C., A.D., but when Jesus talks about history actually coming to a point of change, 
he hinges it on John. John was pretty important for Jesus. Seems like John was pretty important for everyone. Huh. Even the leaders knew him or were afraid of him. The kind of public opinion that he could arouse. He was a well-known, famous prophet. Had followers. Okay. What's the next passage? We have two left. Then I'll let you guys go. Twenty verse what? Twenty verse four through eight. Okay. Chapter twenty, verse four through eight. Let me read this one. This one's important. Huh? I'm going to start at verse 1. It came about on one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. Now here he's in Jerusalem. This is the last week of Jesus' life. He's now at the threshold of his death right here. He's in Jerusalem and he's going to the temple um, daily and he's teaching, getting in a lot of trouble, doing a lot of things, making some people mad. Okay. It came about on one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel that the chief priests and the scribes and the elders confronted him. And they spoke, saying to him, Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, or who is the one who gave you this authority? They're asking him to give a defense for for himself, you know. And he answered and said to them, I shall also ask you a question, and you tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? If we say from men, then all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. And they answered that they did not know where it came from. (laughs) So they they decided to sit on the fence to protect their own butts, you know. So then Jesus said, Well then, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus had them between a rock and a hard place. And here we are at the end of Jesus' ministry, right before he dies. And what issue does he bring up before the Jewish leaders that divides everybody? John. John. John is the foil that so much stuff was around which so much stuff was happening. So the issue here was John's Authority. They didn't respond to John's preaching. Jesus knew that. And he used it as a wedge. He used it in a way uh, to judge them for not responding to God's prophet. You don't even deserve an answer because you didn't listen to God's prophet. Here we are at the end of the life of Jesus, and we're right back to John again. There's one more passage I want you to look at. It's Acts chapter 2, or Acts chapter 1, verse 22. (coughs) This is um, after the, the resurrection. The twelve disciples are, they realize that they, their number represents symbolically the twelve tribes of Israel, and so they feel obliged to replace Judas, who has been lost to them. So they're in the process of getting their numbers back to twelve, 
And what's the condition for any of the candidates to be accepted? The condition is this person has to have been someone who was with us from the beginning. And what is the beginning here? John the Baptist ministry. That was the condition for the 12th disciple to be replaced. He had to have been with them from the beginning. <clears throat> okay, this I hope has been a little bit of, of a demonstration of what I suggested was true behind this comparison. I hope that, that I have been able to do that for you. I'd like to do something else though. That's sort of been a historical context. John was much greater than most of us think because he has, because Jesus was greater, John has sort of shrunk. In fact, in the Gospel of John, John says that. He must increase, I must decrease. That's exactly what happened. But in order for a lot of this stuff to make sense, you have to sort of see the way things were. There's uh, another thing that's, that's happening in Luke. And this is not historical. This is the literary motif. There's a literary motif that's being used by Luke with Jesus and John. The motif, we can call it a literary genre, and it, in fact, it has a name. It's called syncresis, kind of a weird name for a literary genre. But syncresis is two words, one, two Greek words. One means together, and one means divide. So they're sort of antonyms put together, together apart. And this is a, this is a, uh, a literary motif that I have been able to find in a few hero stories from antiquity. And I see Luke uh, doing the same thing with Jesus and John. <clears throat> the, the motif or the literary genre is that one of these characters is the shadow or the alter ego or the second self for the other one. You have a, you have a principal character then you have another one that sort of serves as a second self, a shadow, a foil around the, the, the other character. And one of the things that this shadow does as a service to the main character is he, he helps to prepare him for his destiny. I don't know if you've ever read the Iliad. <clears throat> In the Iliad, the hero of the Iliad is Achilles. The story is all about Achilles. In fact, the first line of the Iliad is the wrath of Achilles. It's about the wrath of Achilles, and, and the story is all about him. It's a 10-year war, but actually I think the Iliad covers like the last 20 days or something like that. It's very, very brief, a very brief part of the story of the Trojan War. Achilles, the leader of the Greek army is Agamemnon, and Agamemnon, even though he was the sort of the chief general, the, uh, the commander-in-chief, the real hero, the real man of the hour, in, in, on the Greek side was Achilles. There was no mistaking about it. If Achilles went out to fight, the Greek army was winning. If Achilles didn't go out to fight, they were losing. 
So he was the, he was the chief character. He was the, really the most important person on the Greek side. Well, the story starts out with Agamemnon. They, um, they captured this, this slave girl and Achilles wanted her as one of his um, playthings. He wanted, he wanted this girl. She was, I think her name was Briseis. Um, he wanted her, what's the word? I can't think of the word. Concubine. Yeah, it's a nice word for it. He wanted, he wanted her for his concubine. Okay. And instead, Agamemnon, who was in charge, of course, Agamemnon denied Achilles this and took Briseis for himself. Well, this is sort of where the story really begins in, in the Iliad because Achilles gets so angry at Agamemnon for this act of pride, this act of hubris, that he goes to his tent and he refuses to come out and engage in the battle. And of course, if Achilles doesn't go out and fight, the Greek army loses. And so the Greek army starts to lose the battle. And it's all about this girl. Achilles didn't get the girl. He's mad. So it's kind of petty, no? It's kind of petty, isn't it? But the point of the story is that it, it develops into this, that the Greek army gets, gets so in, in so much trouble because Achilles won't fight, and the hero on the other side of the, the hero on the, um, on the Trojan side is Hector. And of course, everybody's waiting for Achilles and Hector to finally do battle, right? The two champions of the two armies. <clears throat> Hector comes out and he taunts Achilles, wants him to come out and fight, and Achilles won't come out because he's mad at Agamemnon. He's pouting in his tent because he didn't get the girl. So, um, Patroclus, Patroclus is Achilles sort of his armor bearer, his companion. The word, is, uh, the word is translated in the Iliad Companion. It's the word therapon. Translated companion. <coughs> Actually, though, um, at the point at which this word actually gets taken into the Greek language, it's more like a ritual substitute. But anyway, this is what Patroclus does. Achilles is asleep in the tent, so Patroclus puts on Achilles' armor, his headset, you know, his armory, and he goes out, and everybody thinks it's Achilles. He goes out and he calls, he calls for Hector. Hector comes out, and by this time, you know, everybody is making a lot of noise. Achilles wakes up and he goes out, and he sees that Patroclus has taken his armor and gone out and, done, and was doing battle with Hector. And he was like, oh no, this is terrible. What's going on? Hector, uh, Hector's gonna eat this guy for breakfast, and he does. He slaughters him. Then they take the helmet off and they see it isn't Achilles at all, it's Patroclus. Achilles' alter ego, his second self, his shadow. But what does Patroclus do in the story? He is the motivation for Achilles to put on his armor and go face his destiny. And he does puts on his armor finally, and he goes out and calls for Hector. And I mean, if you guys want to read a, a rated R story, 
read the Iliad, especially the battle between Achilles and Hector, Achilles mops the ground with him, literally. He kills him, then he ties him to his chariot, and he drags him around the city of Troy. He is just so mad. But that's the part that Patroclus plays in this. He finally gets Achilles to face his destiny. The second story is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The main character, the protagonist, is Gilgamesh. The sidekick, the, the shadow, is Enkidu. Gilgamesh is this king that is so much greater than every other human being that he can't find anyone that really is a challenge to him. He's like better at everything. He's smarter, quicker, faster, stronger than anybody else. So life gets kind of boring for him. And then Enkidu shows up. And Enkidu is sort of this, kind of like this wild man from the woods. But when he gets together with Gilgamesh, he's a real challenge to Gilgamesh. I mean, he's sort of like his, um, his equal in a lot of ways. And they have a lot of fun. They go on adventures together. Then they, they go against, uh, uh, they fight this monster from the mountain, and Enkidu dies. And Gilgamesh just can't accept this death. So as a result, he, uh, he goes on a quest for immortality. He's trying to, trying to find out how he can escape this fate that Enkidu <coughs> met with. By the end of the story, he realizes that he can't escape death. He's immortal. He has to accept it and live life completing, the, the, uh, uh, completing and doing the things that he was put on earth to do. In the same way, Enkidu is a foil that helps Gilgamesh face his life, face his destiny. And you see, John does the same thing in Luke's story. Because it isn't until John dies that Jesus starts talking to his disciples about his death. After John dies at the hands of Herod Antipas, Jesus leaves Galilee, the region of Antipas, and he goes up to Caesarea Philippi. While he's up there, there's a lot of things that happen. You can see this in the Gospels. Um, they go on the minor transfiguration. He's transfigured. This is when he predicts his death three times. Matthew chapter, or for example, in Mark chapter 9, 10, and 11, there are three predictions of his death. These all happen on this trip to Caesarea Philippi after John has died. And the foil of John is that he helps Jesus face his destiny, which is going to be death. So we've got a literary motif and a historical motif here operating at the same time. <clears throat> On Tuesday, we'll talk about John's baptism and about Jesus' baptism. The most important thing that John did was baptize Jesus. Even though there's no school? Why? Huh? Oh, really? So there's no classes Tuesday? At all? After four. Okay, then I'll see you a week from today. Thanks for uh, letting me know that, because I, I don't know if I knew that. <laughs>